very, very distinguished and well-known all over the world in his discipline. He has been working on Chinese literature for uh, many decades. Uh, and today he will be speaking on a very, very interesting topic, censorship, morality, and cultural policy under Xi Jinping. Before I hand over to uh, Mr. Ho, let me just mention two things. Uh, I see the abstract and then there is a mention of a triad well known from the history of European philosophy. You're talking about Chen Shan and Ming, right? I just want to point out that in our Indian philosophy, there is exactly a similar thing of Satyam, Shivam and Sundara. Uh, that's one. <coughs> and the other thing that I want to mention, it's just coincidental that you would be speaking on what you are going to speak on. We are in the process of publishing a volume on the 19th Party Congress, and there are two uh, articles in that. One is looking at Xi's thought from a civilization by the eminent historian Professor Pancho, and the other one is looking at Xi and the politics of China, which happens to be so many, but it's in the press. Um, so. We, the, the background is very familiar for all of us here, and the floor is to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll stand so that I can see people in the back as well. Yeah. So, um, and you can hear me in the back. So, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. Uh, it's already in your introduction. I think you've given me some food for thought in terms of some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, and it's, uh, this is a new paper I've, I've been developing for the last year or so, uh, while also trying to run the Institute for Asian Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so it's still very much a, a work in progress, and I very much look forward to your comments. Uh, unlike most papers I present, this one is, is somewhat reliant on long quotes. So from time to time, I will be reading a piece of paper to make sure you get the correct quote. Uh, I'll read the quotes in English and show them on the screen in Chinese for those of you who are Let me tell you a little bit about the background. Uh, so in 2015, I published a book called uh, Internet Literature in China. Um, so I, I did extensive research on the phenomenon of Internet Literature, which is a major cultural phenomenon in China, uh, both uh, in terms of its readership and also in terms of the academic attention it received. Um, and I finished the research for that project in 2012. Um, as is often the case with books like that, it takes a few years to actually get them published. So, in other words, I've never looked at internet literature and internet culture in the years following the appointment of Xi Jinping as General Secretary. Um, so there was a lot, a lot of um, talk going on in the media in the UK, where I live, <coughs> and in the US, where I live now about how Xi Jinping was narrowing the space for cultural production, for academic freedom, for uh, freedom of speech in general. And um, I want to put that to the test in the case of internet culture and internet literature. Um, normally in my research, I mean, I'm, I'm something of a sort of self-professed sociologist of literature, so I, I study literature, but from the perspective of the community that creates it, uh, and the values they create, and the kind of interactions they have with other institutions, uh, relying on concepts such as Pierre uh, Bourdieu's idea of the literary field. Uh, and I'm delighted that Professor Rodnitako is here, who was uh, my classmate in graduate school, and to the best of my knowledge, the first person to introduce the theories of Pierre Bourdieu into English language writing about Chinese literature. So, uh, I'm most grateful to her for introducing me to this very important. So, um, so normally when I look at literature, I look at interactions between individuals, and when I look at censorship, I normally look at censors as individuals who engage in relations 
with other literary producers. So unlike most scholars of censorship, I don't look at it as some massive external force that clamps down on, on cultural production, but rather I look at it as a series of interactions and engagements and transactions between individuals who jointly produce the thing we call literature. Uh, so it's somewhat of a stretch for me to look at <coughs> cultural policy as a whole in general rather than look at these individual uh, transactions. So, but since I now teach in a policy school, uh, I thought it would be time for me to start looking at policy a bit more. Uh, <coughs> and I'm very keen to prove to my colleagues back at home that, uh, that cultural policy should also be part of policy studies. Yes. Something we can all agree on. Um, so my point of departure was um, this particular document, the Guideline Opinions for the Healthy Development of Internet Literature. So this was a policy statement by what was then called the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television, also known as SASAPAPARAT. Yeah. Uh, now it's become something else again, but that was the, the main state body at the time that, that oversaw the production of literature uh, on the internet. And so they issued these guidelines um, for what they call the healthy development of internet literature. Uh, and this was seen by some in the media who commented on it as a form of clamping down on online cultural production. Uh, I did not see it exactly that way. I saw it as a way of, uh, on the one hand, encouraging online cultural producers to self-regulate, but at the same time also encouraging print culture producers to work with online uh, entities in order to become more entrepreneurial, more commercial. So um, I didn't see it as a straightforward form of uh, censorship or control. Uh, but what struck me when I read this document was this particular phrase from the introduction, where it said that the aim of this policy was to constantly guide online literature towards putting into practice the core socialist value system, that's one, Promoting truth, goodness, and beauty, that's two, and communicating positive energy. So these are three interesting terms. Core social value system, we'll come to that in a moment. Truth, goodness, and beauty, we'll come to that in a moment as well. Uh, positive energy is the one that probably many of you have heard of in Chinese, it's Zhong Deng Liang. Uh, it's a term uh, borrowed from a British psychologist whose name I always forget, um, Whiteman, I think his name was, um, and that has Richard Wiseman, a popular TV psychologist from the UK. Uh, that term, for some reason, has been part of the Xi Jinping regime's overall policy. Right? It's about being positive and believing in the strength of China and creating energy from these sort of patriotic things. Um, so, um, but it was really truth, goodness, and beauty that struck me as, as a set of terms that I'd seen before in uh, Chinese literature and culture from the pre-communist era, but I'd never seen so sort of prominently featured in cultural policy from the PSC. Um, so I wanted to find out more about where that came from. Uh, I since then discovered that there are indeed also other sources than the European ones, but um, I'll focus mainly on, on, on those. Um, so one thing I realized straight away that was that a lot of this language came from Xi Jinping's speech uh, from October 2014. <coughs> so Xi Jinping famously sat down with representatives of Chinese literary and artistic circles in October 2014, and held a forum. Uh, and at the forum, he gave a very long speech, uh, and it took exactly one year until October 2015 for that speech to be published in book form with a number of sort of essays uh, included in the book form for publication as well. Um, and this phenomenon, I think, was, was widely represented, at least in the UK and US media, uh, Xi Jinping going back to Mao. 
Mao had the famous 1942 forum in Yan'an. Uh, and the, the, the simplistic conclusion was that Xi Jinping was somehow taking Chinese culture back to the Mao era and once again putting culture in the service of politics. Uh, and people jumped on some parts of the speech where he talks about writers going to the countryside and things like that to say, oh, there's a new cultural revolution in the making. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was, that was ridiculous. Uh, and I want to say from the outset that I do not believe that Xi Jinping has anything near the kind of power over culture that Mao Zedong had. Uh, and indeed, many Chinese writers who heard about this speech uh, were not interested and just shrugged and continued to do their own things. Uh, so uh, I, do, I did not from the outset believe that this was Xi going back to Mao, but I think that by reading the speech and actually looking at some of the language and some of the policies, you can also make that argument stick very convincingly. That's what I hope to do. The speech is very long um, and is divided into five parts linked to five main issues. So these are the five main issues. Number one, to bring about the great revival of the Chinese nation. So that's the uh, official policy aim of the Chinese Communist Party, as many of you 2049, by the 100th anniversary of the DRC, there has to be this great revival. Somehow, China has to be restored to its rightful place in world history or world politics or whatever. Uh, so, to bring about the great revival of the Chinese nation, we need Chinese culture to flourish and prosper. That's number one. So number two, create excellent works that are worthy of this era. Number three, maintain creative directions that place the people at the center. Number four, which is the one I'll be spending most of my time discussing, the Chinese spirit is the soul of socialist literature and the arts. And number five, strengthen and improve the party's leadership of the work of literature and the arts. Um, it's number four where he talks a lot about truth, goodness, and beauty, and the various moral questions. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, look very briefly at the first part. Um, and there's a very long quote there that I want to read to you. Um, this one I don't have in Chinese, I believe. Uh, so um, he talks about the place of Chinese literature and culture in global culture. That's how he starts out. And the significance of culture in general in the world. And there's a very long quote. Um, which I want to read to you in full, where he says, history and reality both show that human civilization is created, created collectively by all countries and all peoples. When I go abroad for visits, what infuses me most are the products of civilization created by the peoples of various countries and nations. The treasures of world civilization are everywhere. <coughs> Let me mention some countries and nations as examples. Ancient Greece created myths, fables, sculptures, and architecture that had a profound impact on human civilization. The tragedies and comedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes are classic works of Greek art. Russia has great masters such as Pushkin, Gogol, Lamontov, Turgenev, Dostoevsky, Nekrasov, Chernyshevsky, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Gorky, Cholagov, Tchaikovsky, Rimsky, Korsakov, Rachmaninov, and Reckon. Remember, this is a speech. <laughs> France has great masters such as Rabelais, La Fontaine, Molière, Stendhal, Balzac, Hugo, Dumas Senior, Dumas Junior, Maupassant, Romain Romain, Sartre, Camus, Millet, Manet, Degas, César, Monet, Retain, Berlioz, Bizet, and Le <laughs> Britain has great masters such as Chaucer, Milton, Bryan, Shelley, Keats, Dickens, Hardy, Shaw, and Turner. Germany has great masters, such as Lessing, Goethe, Schiller, Heinrich, Bach, Beethoven, Schumann, Bach, and The USA has great masters, such as Hawthorne, Longfellow, Beecher Stowe, the only woman on the list, Whitman, Mark Twain, Dreiser, Jack London, and Hemingway. I recently visited India. The people of India also possess a remarkable artistic creative vitality. 
around 1000 BC, pardon my pronunciation, the four Vedas took shape. The Rig Veda, the Atharva Veda, the <laughs> Sama Veda, and the Yadur Veda. Um, and Tagore had an even wider global influence. So that's Indian contributions. <laughs> the four Vedas and Tagore. It's all <laughs> uh, and then without even um, as much as a paragraph break, he then continues, so China has even more. And then he goes, you know, Lao Tzu Confucius, Chi and Wang Shi Zhu, the Bible, Fu Su Zhu, and a few representatives of the ethnic minorities and things like that. Uh, so um, you can read the book. So this, I would say, this is Zhong Nang Liang. This is positive energy. It's like, you know, literature is great. All these countries are great, but we are even greater. Uh, um, oops. So, yeah. But it's sort of interesting, and I think it, you know, because we were used for a long time to this attitude of, well, in China we're still catching up, we're still, you know, learning, we're still becoming, you know, part of global things, and this is, you know, Xi Jinping does that completely differently. Right? So very, very sort of positive focus on China as part of global culture making a unique contribution that is at least on a par with, if not superior to, that of any other great nation. So that's sort of his point of departure when he talks about cultural policy. Which sets him apart immediately from Mao, for example. Mao would not compare himself to the great romantic traditions of European countries or to the ancient traditions of India. I think he would never have done that. So, uh, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, he then goes on in uh, the fourth part of his speech to focus explicitly <coughs> on the link between art and morality. So, uh, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Um, and that's the part of the speech that I'm most interested in. And so I'm interested in how state policy, including censorship, deals with some of the moral questions that arise when you uh, work with people. <coughs> so, he starts out with a very angry description of the moral problems in contemporary Chinese society. Uh, the part in gold, I will read the translation. So he talks about how people are confused these days because of, again, basically because of globalization, different influences coming at them uh, from different cultures. Uh, and then he says, people, as a result, sometimes, you know, they, they lose their sense of values. So they don't know good from bad. They act without bottom line. They're not afraid of doing anything that violates party discipline or our nation's laws. They get up to all kinds of immoral things. They have no sense of nation, no sense of collective, no sense of family. They can't distinguish between right and wrong, true and false, beautiful and ugly, fragrant and fetid. They're all messed up and all they care about is greed and luxury. So this is the, this is the anti-corruption discourse that we know. So, so that's, that's the problem. So people are confused. They have no sense of values something needs to be done. So how does literature come in? Um, sorry, I'm messing up my pages. But, um, here comes the quote. So, <coughs> literature and arts help to build the soul. And writers and artists are the engineers of the soul. That's a famous quote from Sartre. You know? Good works of literature and art ought to be like sunlight in a blue sky, like a gentle breeze in the spring. They can inspire one's mind, warm one's spirit, mold one's life, wipe out all corrupt and decadent trends. He who writes works to be passed on to future generations must have a mind that can be passed on to 
through those generations, which is an famous quote from the 17th century poets that he knew. Uh, so to have the UN Stalin in the same paragraph, I don't think either of them would have ever expected that, but it's, but it's interesting, right? So he's angry about the loss of values and then comes up with literature, culture, art as a way to somehow change some of these bad things. Uh, and he goes on. This is where I'm getting at. The eternal value, you uh, the eternal value of literature and the arts lies in the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. So, the right? Art's highest state is that it moves people, that it baptizes their souls, where he uses the term Lincoln. I thought it was a Christian term, but you're probably going to tell me <laughs> as <laughs> other traditions as well. Yes, it does. <laughs> right. um, it makes them discover the beauty of nature, the beauty of life, the beauty of one's inner spirit. Through literary and artistic works, we must transmit truth, goodness, and beauty, as well as a sense of value that is directed towards improvement <coughs> and goodness. We must guide people to strength their moral judgment, their sense of moral pride, guide them to yearn for and to pursue a life in which they heed morality, respect morality, and observe morality. As long as the Chinese people, for generation upon generation, pursue the moral state, the moral state of truth, goodness, and beauty, our people will always enjoy healthy improvement and always be free. There is corruption and immorality. Literature is this supremely moral thing. If we pursue this supremely moral activity, then there will be truth in this country. Everything will be well. Um, so, I went on a quest for the origins of truth, goodness, and beauty. Hopefully, I went in a different direction than you just pointed out. Uh, I asked various people, you know, I teach at a Catholic university, so I ask people, what about truth, goodness, and beauty? They say, oh, Thomas Aquinas. Say, uh, then I ask people at a non-Catholic university, they say, Plato. <laughs> uh, but wherever I went, I could find truth, I could find goodness, I could find beauty, but not the three of them together, right? So, uh, and in the end, I came across an article uh, from 2016 by, excuse me, uh, scholar called John Levi Martin from Chicago, uh, where he um, talks about the history of this particular triad in European thought. Uh, and I was encouraged because he started out by saying that I thought everybody knew where these three came from, but then I found out that nobody actually knows exactly. Right? So he had faced the same problem as I did. Uh, uh, and he traces it back to you know, the 18th century and nothing going back as far as Plato or something like that. Um, he says that towards the end of the 19th <coughs> century in Western, or sorry, in European literature and culture and art, the interest in truth, goodness, and beauty as a concept, as a triad in concept, disappeared because it simply could not um, withstand the force of more modern ideas about people always having different tastes, different uh, forms of appreciation. Uh, so the universal values, uh, which is what this basically is about, so fell by the wayside from the start of the modernist movement onward and have never really made a comeback, at least in European uh, thoughts about culture. Uh, and then he says the only time when people are still using this triad is if they want to make a last-ditch effort to preserve notions of excellence and validity in the face of irreducible and undeniable differences across persons, places, and time. In other words, people who try to build value systems, they like to use these terms. Xi Jinping, I think, is a very good example of someone who's trying to build a value system. Uh, I found another example um, which uh, for me, in my environment, was very relevant. This particular quote about the link between good and beautiful, stirring fruitful reflection, uh, and so on. 
and so forth uh, comes from a letter to artists published by Pope John Paul II in 1999. So, he said the Catholic University had to mention the Pope at least once. <laughs> in my contract. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> so, um, but it's again, it's interesting. It's, it's this very sort of moralistic view of what literature and art and culture produce for sort of the best of the best that humanity has to offer. So, um, so Xi Jinping presents this very idealistic, moralistic view of culture as something very, very positive for society, very beautiful, very true, very real, very beneficial, and so on. But he also has a second set of values to promote, as we saw in the very first, first slide. Uh, and the second set of values are the values, uh, the core values of social. Right? So then he comes to the point that you know, writers are individuals who are um, individuals that people look up to. So uh, they are well-known individuals. People expect them to be exemplars. Uh, and therefore, writers and artists are called upon to not only be the exemplars of the truth, goodness, and beauty, but also be the exemplars of the core values of socialism. So, writers and artists should not only pursue excellence in literary and artistic creation, that's part there, but also strive for excellence in ideological and moral cultivation. Most especially, they should strive to embody the core values of socialism, turning noble words into exemplary actions. Bring together this moral terminology of truth, goodness, and beauty, which, whether it comes from India or from Europe, definitely does not come from China. <laughs> and then he tries to bring that together with socialism, which, let's face it, also does not come from China. Uh, and then he has to define the essence or the core values of socialism. And then he comes up with the most remarkable statement. He said, amongst the core values of socialism, patriotism, I bore to you, is the most profound, most fundamental, and most eternal. Patriotism is an inexhaustible theme. Works that contain patriotic sentiments are the most capable of encouraging the youth of China to fight together. I invite you to reflect on a new definition of socialism. <laughs> so socialism is not an international movement aimed at redistributing wealth and making life better for everybody. Socialism is patriotism. When I give this talk in the US, I then stare into the classroom and say, Donald Trump is a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, to be fair to Xi Jinping, he's not the first socialist leader to have, you know, it's not the Stalin comes up as an example, uh, to have taken up patriotism. Right? But you see how the whole thing sort of comes full circle. Right? So we are this great nation that produces great literature. And, you know, and literature is great because it makes people better people. And it's also this wonderful instrument to create patriotism, which makes us feel even greater about our nation. And so the whole thing sort of goes full circle in that sense. But still, you know, I think it's a remarkable, remarkable thing. So, um, first time I gave this talk even more mature at the time was at a, at a conference about a year and a half ago in the US and uh, a number of people who were in the audience, um, most of them people who had experience living in China during the socialist period, um, <coughs> said to me, oh no, but this term, term Shan Mei, has been used in China for a very long time and Communist Party used that all the time. I remember that. <laughs> I, I remember it. From, because I used to study, you know, the Republican period, I remember it from Chen you Meishan know, in this famous magazine from the 1920s. Uh, I can even find Chen Meishan magazine 
from the 1940s, but I really don't remember it being a term that was very powerful, certainly in the Mao period. So, so I did something um, unusual, perhaps. I went to the Chinese Academic Journal's database, uh, and I searched, you can't do a full text search in that database, but you can search. So, um, thank you very much. You can search for words in titles. Uh, so I searched for the, the triad Chen Shan Mei in titles of articles published in Chinese academic journals between 1950 and 2007. Uh, and sure enough, it has to be expected uh, under Mao from 1950 to 1977 78, this term is pretty much constant. And it makes sense, it's a kind of idealistic view of art that doesn't fit into the very pragmatic socialist view of culture that Mao, socialist realist view of culture. So, so I was happy to see that confirm the fact that this was not a traditional Chinese socialist terminology. Uh, the one occurrence in the period before 1966 is in a translation of a sonnet by Shakespeare. <laughs> so, a sonnet by Shakespeare translated into Chinese. So, uh, so there's no significant discussion at all of this terminology between 1950 and 1977. And then in 1978, someone called Chen Shouming uh, publishes an article called um, Chen Shan Mei, So True Goodness and Beauty in Proletarian Literature. And it's an article about Maxim Gorky. Uh, Russian literature. And that's in 78. So, and that's sort of, it's still very conventional in terms of the terminology, but uh, it's probably, as far as I've been able to detect, for the first time that someone says, well, literature has certain values that connect to earlier periods in history um, and that are not necessarily all literature. So, uh, and between 78 and 80, 81, you see there's a lot of debate amongst intellectuals in China about values. And literature is one of the, the battlefields for those debates. The idea that if you have something like literature, it has a history of its own. And there are great works from different periods and from different countries. And you don't always have to figure out whether they're linked to whatever system of you know, social organization, whether they're feudal or capitalist or something. You know, they have values of their own. Intrinsic. Uh, intrinsic, universal values. Uh, and, you can, and in the context of those debates, which are allowed in the early reform period, which the, the regime allows and encourages, in the context of those debates, all of a sudden, the triad, truth, goodness, and beauty, reappears, almost out of nowhere. Um, an example would be this article, which has an accompanying cartoon. Um, the article is called The True, the Good, and the Beautiful Standards for Literary Criticism. Very typical title of an academic article from around 1980. And then the cartoon shows uh, you know, the famous quote from Nemencius, uh, I like bear's paw, I also like fish, if I can't have them both, and I prefer the bear's paw, right? So in this case, the bear's paw says politics, the fish says art, and in the other cartoon, the fish says art. And so you can either have art, or you can have politics. You cannot have them both. Right? The non-integrationist, theory of art. And so this is, I would argue, the consensus of the early reform period, where intellectuals, writers, artists are told by the party, and presumably there's some sort of negotiation, that it is now okay to talk about art as something independent with intrinsic values, as long as you keep it separate from politics. So if you guys don't get involved in politics, and then we won't mess with your heart. That's the basic consensus of the 1980s. 
Um, so I would argue that by going back to this terminology, Xi Jinping is not going back to Mao. He's going back to the early reform. And he's saying to the people he's addressing, the artists and the writers, the basic consensus still holds. We still accept that you artists do something that's very important, beautiful, virtuous, etc. Um, and continue doing that, and we will do the politics. I think that's, in a sense, that is still what he's saying. He's not arguing for a return to earlier politics. However, um, I put that to the very famous critic, Liu Taifu, um, who in 1981 published the story of Lu Xun, uh, where the entire book is organized on the basis of the three concepts, truth, goodness, and beauty. And he, he uh, argues for those three to be the norms for literary criticism. And the Otafu is very, very influential yeah. critic, but um, he now lives outside China. Um, and I managed to get in touch with him via WeChat. <laughs> and I, I put this, to, I asked him, I said, where did you get these terms from? Because they were not mentioned for 20 years. And he said, well, they may not have been mentioned in public, but, you know, in school, sometimes our teachers would mention them, and then somehow we always felt that these were, you know, this was what true art was about, truth, goodness, and beauty. Well, these were the kind of universal values we really wanted to promote, and rather than all that political stuff. So, so then I said to him, well, then how do you feel about Xi Jinping using these terms now? Are you then in agreement with that, I feel that he's still giving people the same opportunities as in the early 80s. And he said, well, maybe not. He said, because when we were discussing this around 1981, we were allowed to talk about universal values spirit. Now, Xi Jinping allows us to talk about who allows people to talk about the values of literature, but he imposes some restrictive factors on them, especially patriotism. So it's no longer universal. You have to somehow bring out you know, what is specifically Chinese about it and why that is better than something else. But, so he's saying true debate of universal values no longer happens in China. That was his opinion. So, um, and I, and, you know, you can see how that makes sense. Right? So, um, you have the moral framework, but at the same time, on top of that, you are sort of limiting the space of discussion by bringing in the socialist values defined as patriotism. So Xi Jinping is shrinking the space. He's not removing or closing down the space, but he's shrinking the space. So, um, so reluctantly. Well, not really. No, not at all. Start that sentence again. So I agree with the people who say that Xi Jinping is shrinking the space for literary production, but I don't think he's shrinking it as much as he's shrinking the space for other forms of expression, he's but <laughs> he's definitely shrinking it. Um, the question then, in the end, becomes, so what's the point? So who's actually, who's going to suffer from this? Who's going to be, what, what's he going to do to put this kind of policy into practice? Are there actually going to be writers and writing stuff that adheres to these principles? Uh, and so I went back to some of the online literature websites that I looked at in my study uh, and that I visited prior to Xi Jinping coming to power. Uh, and there's one chapter in my book, uh, I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but one chapter in my book about the internet literature is specifically about erotic literature online and the moral questions that, uh, that arise from that. Uh, so China very famously uh, <coughs> censors erotic content without using an age limit. It's a political question. So something is either healthy for everybody or unhealthy for everybody. Right? So around 2011, you would come across online novels with this kind of uh, 
appearance of lots of advertisements for erotic uh, products. Um, this particular advertisement talking about the I mean, the underpants <laughs> revolution. <laughs> 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 so, just rereading that and saying, am I reading it right? <laughs> if anyone wants to do research <laughs> on the discourse of revolution in Chinese culture, this has to do. Uh, and then certain words could not be written <laughs> in characters. So, so I went back to that website, and it now looks like this. So gone are all the advertisements for. Yeah, we're talking in minutes. And then the one word that can't be written in characters is Chuang, which means big. Wait. Can you say me a copy of this? I will. Okay. Can you say a copy of this? Yeah. So. Um, the question I leave you with, if this is the only effect of Xi Jinping's cultural policy, it's not too bad. You know, it seems that the ones who suffer are the ones that are you know, powerless in many ways in terms of the things they produce, very marginal, considered to be very vulgar, etc. So um, whether or not others are suffering or, or uh, experiencing any consequences is the question I really always put to my audience, uh, if you have observed any changes as a result of this cultural policy in China, specifically with the use of these moralist terms. So for me, this is, this is a major change in terms of what I study, but it's maybe not a major change in terms of cultural policy in general. So uh, I look forward to hearing your experiences. I look forward to talking about Xi Jinping, about cultural policy. About Truth, goodness, and beauty, uh, or any other questions you may have. So, thank you very much. Well, uh, Mr. Holtz, that was uh, absolutely riveting in many ways um, for bringing in a wide range of sources. And I'm still stuck by the kind of things that you do and the kind of things I do. Academic. We need to read each other's books. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the floor is open. Uh, we will take a few questions at the time. Yes, sure. Just to know, the elaboration and point you made that uh, Xi Jinping is shrinking the space for like, literary production, but not as much as he's doing for other forms of expression. Can you I also have a slight point of discussion. First, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to have Michelle here with us. And uh, uh, Michelle, I thought that was extremely interesting. And I, I quite like the fact that you're trying to make a comparison between many things that Mao said about the enterprise and what uh, she took in this. And I quite agree with you that I don't think she is going back to Mao. Because one of the key differences, and this is, these are three models, and they're very, very interesting. If you look at literary politics, it's really Lunacheski, Plekhanov, Zhao Yang under Mao, which is socialist realism, which he pointed out. And where, you know, the beauty of literature is quite clearly stated in very, very, very concrete class terms and class analysis. <coughs> and literature in the Maoist time is not supposed to be sweet and loving, just like a revolution is not a tea party. Literature is actually supposed to shock, to educate, to actually create uh, amongst the masses this revolutionary zeal. So the goal of literature is, in that sense, propagandist, and the modern values are class values. What I found so interesting in your paper today is how clearly uh, Chinese communist ideology, because when you know, starting from the Chiamu, mm -hmm. uh, that whole period, the control of military policy is very key to Chinese propaganda efforts and whatever. You know, that, that's always been cultural policy, key to cultural policy. What I find so interesting is the substitution of Qingshen instead of Chechi, of Ai Kuo Chuyi instead of Kung uh, Chang and I think uh, I think that also, in a way, will encapsulate the kind of controls that are being exercised, the semantic difference in what counts as need to be controlled. And coming back to Tan Shan Mei, uh, you know, there's this wonderful book I have on old song poetry. If you look at classical Chinese aesthetic theories, 
theories of traditional Chinese aesthetics, uh, including in painting, in, you know, theories of classical aesthetics in China. You will certainly, I think, uh, be, I would be intrigued to see whether within traditional aesthetics, because these formulations are much more classic than, than modernist, whether tracing roots from European histories or uh, you know, international histories. I'd be quite interested uh, in, in what you find out okay. about, about that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, may I request everybody to keep their uh, questions and comments a little short, because there are many questions. I see a whole range of people from my department. <laughs> and uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, Vinod. Uh, we know okay. Uh, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was, was, uh, was, uh, was on the question of you know, fundamental difference between uh, Mao and Xi's approach, or the objective of what literature is all about. But I was very intrigued by the, the listing in his speech of all the great uh, writers and you know, of, the, of the world. Um, now, Mao, as far as one can remember, every single thing which he wrote, he had, a, he had a, whatever, agreed or disagreed in air authenticity about it. But here it seems that he's got somebody else to list all these names for him. Could he ever have read these people? Uh, is there anything else in which sees um, speeches or anything, writing, that indicates <laughs> knowledge of any of these things? It's an NCD. Yeah. Shall we take three questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you, thank you very much. I'm just happy because mine is related to what the already okay. said. Okay. Okay. So sure. And then we will have a session. Yeah. Uh, no, it's very interesting. What you said suddenly brought to my mind the phrase very current in the 80s. I think it was 80s. Mm -hmm. The spiritual pollution. Yes. Ting mm -hmm. Ah, yes. So I wonder if Xi Jinping is actually going back to the days of Catholic the spiritual pollution, describing it in the name of a kind of, you know, cultural policy, number one. And this belief is reinforced when he talks about patriotism being the most profound uh, part of the socialism, really. And who defines the patriotism? He simply himself, just like the corruption. He will, he will tell you what is patriotism and what is not. So essentially he's talking about the loyalty and all those things again. And in that context, again, very briefly, this is the last point I'm making, <coughs> what role does Confucius play in defining these moralities, this new sense of morality? Thank you. So, um, well, the, so the shrinking spaces, so, so when I say that the space for literature is shrinking, but not as much as the space for other types of expression, so I'm thinking of rights activists, lawyers, NGOs, etc. You know, so I think literature is not seen as being a challenge to the state or to being a direct challenge to the authority of the Communist Party in a way that some of these other uh, activities are. And I also think writers in general um, give a lot of Chinese writers don't necessarily want to be associated with distance or political activity as such. Right? So, um, and that I think has been a consensus since the 1980s. And, um, and there are exceptions, of course, but I think that is, that is the consensus. So, um, and um, so Xi Jinping wants to have some control over that space, but I don't think it's something that's and I think that's part of the, uh, so the Communist Party, as, as Rafni was saying, that's, that's part of the Communist Party's sort of typical modus operandi is that they want to have some say of, of what happens in culture. Um, but I think, judging by this speech, he's sort of satisfied to just make sure that he pushes towards a kind of culture that is lofty, pretty, and otherwise innocuous, <laughs> so it does not challenge anything. Um, that, that to me is, is um, seems to be what it's about. Uh, and, you, and a lot of it actually, so I give the example of the online literature, but you also see it playing out, for instance, 
in other types of culture. Uh, I had a student who, an undergraduate student actually at Notre Dame, who did a project on the popularity in China of hip hop music, where there was this very, very popular sort of talent show on, on, on the internet where hip -hop, Chinese hip hop artists were competing with each other. And, and uh, you know, the group that won in the end, they then went on and recorded some songs that in true hip hop fashion were very provocative, used foul language, talked about sex, etc. And then immediately the whole thing got closed down. Uh, but then a year later, the show came back. And they changed their name slightly. They said, now we're going to promote Chinese hip-hop. <laughs> hip-hop with Chinese, Chinese characters. <laughs> and then it was, so you had this weird mixture of rap music with a little bit of Chinese, Chinese theater in the background. And, was, and the, you know, it was all very beautifully produced. And the singers were very good singers. And the rappers were very good rappers. The content was very sort of patriotic or just, you know, Sanitized. So that's that's so that's the idea of health. So, um, as to I'm skipping, skipping to the third question, because second and fourth are related. So, uh, yes. So Mao sounds a lot more authentic, uh, whereas we're speaking. You have the feeling someone else is writing his speech, uh, and someone else is writing his speech. Is like most. And Mao did write his own speech. So. Uh, so actually, he didn't. That's the thing. So, so, so because because I, because of this, uh, I actually then went back and asked people in China also did Mao write his own speeches, and then and then people were saying saying that well, we are actually now starting to doubt this, and maybe it was actually Hu Xiaohu or something, <laughs> and he maybe didn't even write his own poem. Not text, not text. They got contradiction. <laughs> there is even controversy now of whether or not Mao wrote his own poem. So, now that's getting me interested. Never thought of that. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, but in the case of this very long quote from Xi Jinping, I think it's the fact, you know, the listing of all the authors, you can tell they must have just asked different people, what shall we put in for France? What Surely he hasn't read the Vedas. No. <laughs> I would Maybe Xi Jinping presented him a copy of the yeah. Ramayana. But also the fact that Sartre is in there for France. Yeah, I mean, None I, of the I'm communists sure are there. Somebody slipped in something you know, that didn't really fit what he was talking about. The most shocking for me as a Chinese literature scholar was that the names he mentions for Chinese literature are, you know, the six uh, names that were sort of the, the core of the curriculum in the 80s. Again, Lu Guo Mao Ba Lao Chao Li Xun, Wu Mo Ruo, Mao Dun, Ba Jin, Lao Shu, and Cao Yu. And even in China, that's no longer the truth, right? He's 20 years behind in that as well. So a lot of it is. Yeah, he doesn't mention a single contemporary author, whether from China or from elsewhere. Not even the Nobel Prize. Yes. So it's all canonical, safe, canonical, etc. Okay. Now coming to the second and the fourth question. So so this question surrounding the idea of control. How, uh, how this changes the kind of thing. So I think um, one area that I think I should look into more is not so much cultural production as such, but teaching about culture. So I, recent, I think some of the textbooks that are coming out are now starting to use you know, truth, goodness, and beauty as their standards. Mm -hmm. and or emphasizing authors that were mentioned by Xi Jinping in his speech and things like that. Right? Well, so, that yeah. so it's, and I think that's with a lot of the propaganda in China. He's not necessarily trying to influence the leading intellectuals, yeah. he's trying to influence you know, the masses of graduate students who memorize a textbook. Right? So it may, it may be that, that some of the control is happening there, actually. Um, spiritual. Pollution. I was thinking about that as I was talking because that's, you know, that sort of goes against the consensus. I think, and I think spiritual pollution people look back at it now and think it's a bit of a failed campaign. Uh, they tried to do something and then they didn't really follow it. Yeah. So I think that's, um, but again, it's something you could put into patriotic terms, right? Because the spiritual would be Chinese and the it would be. And pollution Western, would be external. So. There's certainly a, a sort of a kernel of that when he says people are confused 
more orally because so many things are coming in from the outside, therefore we have to re-educate them. Exactly the same arguments being made about Muslims in Xinjiang. Confused about things coming from the outside, we have to re-educate them. It's, it's always the same. Um, Confucius, uh, interestingly, you would have expected more of Confucius in, yes. uh, in this. So, um, because Confucius certainly comes into a lot of discourse about values to do, for instance, with, with gender, with relationships, uh, with uh, family hierarchies and things like that. So, um, so I don't know why Confucius isn't here more, uh, maybe because from a literary perspective, maybe literature has always been associated more with Buddhism and Taoism. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Um, classical theories of so I don't think Zheng Shanghai is a triad that appears in classical Chinese theories of literature. However, the textbooks that are now appearing, or the study guides, you know, there's like an official study guide for Xi speech and things like that. And there are people now writing articles about Xi Jinping's speech and books about it. And, and so one of the recent books about truth, Christians, and beauty actually starts out by saying, uh, so it talks about the European tradition, talks about the Indian tradition, but then it's, and then it talks about the Chinese tradition, but as far as I can tell in the Chinese tradition, it's about the three individual terms rather than rather about than the three common. together. So, um, but I haven't done, you know, nearly enough research on that, so, I, um, so thank you for that. And that's something that needs to be further researched. Okay, next set of questions, please. Yeah, please. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Batsala Mishra from Christ University, Bangalore. And uh, my question to you is, sir, uh, how do you differentiate between the kind of patriotism which Xi Jinping is uh, spreading in China? How do you differentiate uh, from Jingoism? From Jingoism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a one-line question. Yeah, it's I'm Usha from uh, JNU. So uh, my question is again, um, so basically uh, I'm just a bit confused because uh, <laughs> <laughs> because we know China, we know China, and this is what is this is what China is fundamentally. So can we just go beyond uh, what we know uh, that okay, China is like this, and we we know that they have different way of doing things? Can we also look at it some other level? Like why is is it just because also it's just an alternate reality? Because we can't think that everything there has to be one reality because every country has got their own realities. So if we look at China and what they are doing, what Xi Jinping is doing, so uh, could it be uh, as the history, to, throughout history, it's been like there has to be one direction and the people have to be given a direction. And here, because they're confused, we have to give a direction. In India, we are allowed to have several directions in the sense because we are so used to it. And that one, and also uh, whether you've looked at the debates or the reaction of the speech uh, anywhere, like especially among the intellectuals. Yeah, okay. Is there any list of uh, books banned during this particular situation? Uh, Which particular book? Which particular book? Which particular book? Maybe for corruption, it's not for the culture. So, um, publishers and editors. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, could, could you say a little bit more about patriotism versus jingoism? Uh, give me something to work with. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Just define what you mean by jingoism. 
no, no. Uh, the way they suppress the religious groups, they like they are putting down the flags from the mosques and they are putting off the crosses from the churches. After such suppression, how do we expect people to be patriotic? Like they will uh, have a rebellious attitude and then they suppress them by saying that they are creating a mass uprising in China. So the kind of patriotism they are seeking out of uh, like uh, suppression, I think it's a bit different from what we say patriotism and jingoism. Patriotism cannot be forced on people. Right. Yeah. I agree with you, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we sometimes underestimate what I, based on things I've read, what I consider to be one of the most successful things the communist regime in China has done <coughs> over the past uh, almost two and a half decades now, and that is the campaign of patriotic education where from the Jiangzemin period onwards, you know, it has been state policy to make sure that education in schools and also at the undergrad level in universities was focused on, first of all, uh, fostering love for the motherland and also repeating it again and again and again what the Communist Party has done through history in order to make you know, China stronger and better. And, and this, you know, after more than one generation now, is, is really having an influence. And these discourses are uh, present in the minds of many, many people, uh, as you would expect if that's if you, if you hear that from the world. And, and these are the same discourses that are being used when talking about literature that, uh, as the ones that are being used when talking about, for instance, minorities and their religions. So, so, um, with uh, two of my master's students, we were reading a recent article where they were talking about the policy of how you should put into effect patriotic <coughs> education for students from ethnic minorities that come to your universities in Beijing and Shanghai, etc. And that was, and it was very much the same thing. Uh, they, they've gone to middle school and high school in their native regions. They probably haven't been given enough patriotism, so we should give them a lot more patriotism. And there are these, you know, 400 page textbooks that are aimed especially at that. So, uh, and the term is always I go to read, and it's always distinct from means of read nationalism because that could refer to ethnic nationalism. Right? So, uh, okay, that's what should be discarded. Yes. Yes. So I think it's. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah, you, it's not really a wet welcome. So it's it's. Uh, I think it's so we can yeah you know, we can say it's not how we define patriotism, but I think it's it's you know it's one of the very few things that I think has consistently happened from you know, the early nineties all the way up to now and that has really had an impact on on how especially the Han people think. I'm gonna answer the other question. I know sure, sure. we can follow up this. Uh, reading this uh, literature departments, excellent question. So I haven't gone to that yet, but I've heard from other people uh, specifically, I gave this talk recently and there was a professor of art history in the room who said that in art history departments of art programs in China now, there are these shifts happening that a bit more attention is now being given again to the kind of art that can fit with some of these concepts, true and good and beautiful and canonical. And, uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, I think that may be the more <coughs> significant impact than the impact actually on writers. Uh, so there's no list of banned books. Uh, there hasn't been, you know, this hasn't linked to any kind of direct censorship of any kind of publications as far as I know. Uh, and indeed there is, especially in the context of these moral questions, there is, there is actually debate, uh, which again shows that space isn't struck as much as in other areas. Recently, a Chinese writer was jailed for 10 years by a provincial court for publishing a pornographic novel based on a law from the 1980s. And even the, you know, the Global Times, the sort of most patriotic pro-Communist Party newspaper, published an article saying, well, maybe this is just no longer what we do in this day and age. So we hope this, you know, a higher court will look at this. So, so relatively speaking, in these cases, the legal system functions a bit better, the control is a bit more sort of discursive than uh, aggressive, and so on. Um, the reaction to it, and that's a, you know, that's a great question, right? How, 
So cultural policy in general, how does it work? You know, you can do comparative studies of cultural policy, which I think is a wonderful thing to do. And, uh, when you live in the U.S., people often don't even understand the notion of cultural <laughs> policy. Yeah, yeah, the government should have anything to do with culture, but I think in many countries... Actually, they did. Uh, of course. Uh, in many countries, they do. Um, so the reaction has been very interesting. The, uh, the, so the most established writers and artists, they just shrug because they don't need the government anymore. They can publish their works in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, or just with more or less independent publishers in China. They can publish their work online. They can have it translated. They really don't care. And they don't seem to be uh, suffering any effects from this. And actually, they sort of look down very much so. It's all about symbolic capital. They look down on the writers who sat down at the table with Xi Jinping. Uh, those are not real life. Uh, those are political hacks. Uh, so whereas Xi Jinping has the political capital, the symbolic capital is somewhere else. It is amongst the sort of cultural elite. Yeah, it's probably yeah. Well, yeah. Or even in China, the cultural elite yeah. that doesn't want to be associated with the one farm with the official system. Right? So the reaction has been, in those areas, been very lukewarm. Uh, I always give the example, I, I gave this talk, the first time I, I properly gave this talk was last year in Hong Kong, it was a keynote lecture at a, a big conference on Chinese literature, and a um, very famous Chinese author who has been subjected to censorship more than once uh, was there, and he saw my title and he just looked out. He didn't even want to hear it. So, which, you know, I respect, you know, he's been a, he's been a bit firm. Uh, it's uh, oh, that's his name. Uh, the one who wrote with uh, serve the people and, and uh, come to me in a moment. Right? Um, anyway, so which is which is fine, right? but um, so he is well known enough and, and uh, safe enough to just not be able not to have to not to have to. So there's no engagement. So I think in terms of the cultural elite, there's no engagement at all. Uh, what would be interesting to see is what happens when there are gatherings of say, the Writers' Association and the Artists' Association. Because all those elite writers and artists who claim to want to have nothing to do with the government, they are still all members of the Writers' Association. And because sometimes that means you get to know, go to nice meetings in nice places, or you get a little bit of a stipend here, or a reception there. And then you have to go through the motions and mouth the policy a little bit. Right? So that, that would be interesting to see whether or not that terminology then gets used on those occasions. Um, but in general, I think my opinion is that the cultural elites very much look down on this attempt by a politician to talk about art and literature. There is a there is a cultural elite in China. Oh, yes. Actually, it's the first time that a major president has actually Yeah, since. Uh, since. Any other question? Any other question, please? You know, when you say that uh, these eminent writers, etc., are safe, um, because they can write anywhere and anywhere, they're living in China and are in danger if they cross the Political yeah. uh, mm -hmm. related question. Incidentally, that. you know, I mean, though um, uh, the judge on May comes as a trial, uh, is it always to be in your own analysis, etc., to be thought of as a trial and not as three distinct values? It's, it's always so, so, first of all, I mean, when I say safe, I mean, safe. Within reason. Well, within reason, right? So it's. Um, <laughs> So the fact that Xi Jinping says literature has to be like this doesn't mean that these people are not going to write like that. And the only rule, but the, then the only rule that applies for them is that as long as they don't cross whatever line there is. But even then, you know, if you're you are, you can cross a lot of lines. Yeah, yeah. You can write in the New York Times about your fourth and still live in the right? So it depends on who you are and, and, and how you're connected. Um, but 
Uh, and now I forget your second question. No, the triad. The triad. So it seems to always be presented as a triad, but then some, sometimes it's sort of broken down into individual terms, right? But from what I understand, the, the, the uniqueness also, as it developed in European thought, of it being a triad is that, you know, is that beauty is present <coughs> as a universal or a transcendental to truth and goodness. And truth and goodness were always you know, there in thinking about art. Right? But, um, but to have beauty added to that, which is an element of taste somehow becoming universal, and to have those three somehow intermingling with each other, um, that was the novelty, and I think the way it's being used in the China seems to suggest that it's also thought of as a triad. <coughs> Coming back to your point, then you pointed out that uh, so when it comes to literary domain, uh, if you are careful, you don't cross certain red lines, uh, you are relatively safe. You seem to be innocuous, uh, you are safe. But uh, are there situations uh, where this rule doesn't apply, the strength of doesn't apply? So I have in mind, for instance, for Sapin and Shincha, where the red line is shifting. You know, just as reading, uh, you just checked again, uh, there's no times for the whole. Uh, there's the same article. And they gave example of more than 100 literary and cultural personalities, most of whom knew how to navigate within the Chinese system including a former editor in chief of Shenzhen civilization. Uh, so they are not people you know, who will uh, sort of, they knew uh, yes. that you have to be careful. Uh, they have been detained. Because it's not because uh, they have been uh, less innocuous, but because the threshold of what is innocuous has been raised suddenly. So it's really dependent on threat perception. These are the specific situations, specific regions, specific issues. Absolutely. And, and nothing I said applies to Xinjiang. Uh, <laughs> 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 because, because, you know, what's, what's the good news? And I read the same article you mentioned. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, as, um, but anything that maybe applies to Xinjiang, and this may, may be a provocative thing to say, but I think after 20 odd years of patriotic education, which really is hung patriotic education, I think Xi Jinping knows that whatever he does in Xinjiang, he has the support of the majority of the population. If he were to try that anywhere else in China, maybe in Tibet, um, he would help. To well, no, his, the whole concept of sanitization of Islam, actually is trying beyond the Xinjiang. Uh, everywhere in the world at the moment, uh, yeah, I mean, it's officially sanctioned. I mean, now it has, you know, it's not any longer yeah. where sort of surreptitious yeah. campaign yeah. has been given official sanction. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah. quite Any other question? Yeah. 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 Very, very good brief remark. You know, I, yeah, I, I agree that yes, yeah. at the general area, the Han <coughs> support for really dealing with the Islam in Xinjiang is okay, but I do detect that ultimately what matters is the threat perception of the leadership. And if at any given time Xi Jinping does feel that the things are getting all out of hand, I don't know if even the cultural personalities and the artists living in China are saying yeah, that. You remember the case of the Interpol uh, deputy chief? Yeah. He was not a cultural personality. He was not a cultural personality. <laughs> but basically because if you, have believed, if you have to believe the rumors, he could not oblige his thing also over something. He was arrested when he came back. So I think ultimately it becomes very transactional, just like in the case of Trump. If you don't do something, then you suffer. Yeah, but that, that's yeah, I would agree with that. But I think that's where I think that's why literature and art are interesting 
field to study, you know, because there is in many studies and in many societies, including China, it is accepted that in literature, for instance, things can be said in such a way that they don't necessarily mean what you think they mean. Right? And this is this is sort of the basic <coughs> assumption underlying censorship uh, in many countries uh, that the censors and the cultural producers sort of agree. Well, there are certain types of writing that we're just that is so obscure that we're just going to assume that it's not criticizing us. <laughs> and so, uh, and that, if you go back, look at how modern literature came about and the notions of obscurity and ambiguity, and a lot of that has to do with evading censorship. So, I think that's that's. Um, so yes, if, if a literary group were to stand up and say we are now going to write highly realistic works that attack the Communist Party, then of course yes, that, that would be disastrous, right? even if they did it outside China. Um, but I always want to remind people, and again, especially in the, in the US, where there seems to be an expectation that Chinese writers would do that. Right? So there's a kind of spurious kind of Orientalism which expects mm -hmm. Chinese writers to be political, whereas Western writers can be yeah, able yeah. And I just don't think in Georgia Chinese writers want to be political in that way. Why should they? It's, it's, uh, it doesn't mean they're not restricted, Indeed, right? yeah. but it does mean that they have, they have more space, and they still have more space. Also, in terms of gatherings uh, that are these days sponsored by private individuals, by companies, Publications that are maybe not in bookstores, but that they can sort of circulate, websites, etc. There's an awful lot of variety in Chinese literature, despite despite what Stephen King is doing. So, in that sense, uh, although there is a narrowing in terms of the definition of particular types of literature, I don't think there is that much of a narrowing of production, except for people like this who have no power. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's the new thing. Okay, 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 the actual intellectual <coughs> elite critique mm -hmm. of the Communist Party, even amongst writers, artists, is coming from the left. Yes. It is students who write in uh, It is using the language of Marxism yes. to criticize mm -hmm. the Communist Party, to protest the situation. Yes. So I wonder, uh, just keep this in the back of your mind. It's Trent Chan, part of moving away. You know what yes. I mean? You know what I'm yes. trying to say. So you have the cultural elite who just. They just don't want to be bothered by the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you have Xi Jinping who wants to have some sort of control, and then you have the sort of <coughs> left wing intellectual elite. And the very powerful group is left wing uh, critical. Absolutely. absolutely. Okay, Atul? Uh, how how do you think that the Xi Jinping's patriotism, uh, different from the socialist patriotism as you spoke about, mm -hmm. is different from the right wing patriotism in Europe and America that we are seeing now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, there are a lot, of things, a lot of things in common, especially when it comes to the rejection of Islamic communities. Uh, I think perhaps where Xi Jinping differs from you know, the Trumps and the Boris Johnsons and people like that is that he's actually preaching globalism. So he's not talking about building walls and shutting down and you know, he's, he's constantly talking about you know, we want to promote globalization and China wants to play a leading role in that. So it's in a sense economic it's, globalization. Yeah, economic globalization, but culturally through soft power is also, also. I mean, and that's why some of this is interesting because if there's one area where China imports more than it exports, it's, it's culture, yeah. including print industry, books, and things. You know, there's a huge uh, um, deficit when it comes to the, book, you know, the copyright trade in China. So, and that's you know something they really want to change. I think. So, so it's it's a very as we saw. I mean, it's a very sort of gung ho, positive kind of patriotism built on a global conception. Uh, 
And in that sense, I think it differs from, at least from the right-wing patriotism that, or nationalism that we see in Europe and in America. Of course, there's also left-wing <laughs> nationalism in Europe. <laughs> might be a bit mm. That would be my, my answer. Okay. Any other question? If there isn't any, then I'll ask one question. Oh, very smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's waiting for them to set you up. Um, you know, I want to talk a bit about you to talk a bit about Moya. About Moya and the Nobel. Now, I, I'll tell you from what perspective. Moya, you know, all the controversies that was generated after he was awarded the Nobel within China and China. Uh, and then it seemed to me at that point that initially there was a lot of reluctance within the Chinese literary circle about accepting his, him uh, by his, on his literary merit. Uh, but then one could see that there was a line being pushed by the state and the party that here is a showcase that we have finally got our Nobel, the truly Chinese Nobel, right? And then there was research cells were set up all over the place. Uh, but what has happened since then? I mean, nobody talks about Moya anymore. And I don't know, I mean, it is, it's, it's that, or is China's obsession with a Nobel satisfied? Uh, and I, I'm not sure that there are, there are so many others who are much more capable, much more to be considered at an international level. So, generally. Yeah, no, I thought, you know, well, first of all, you know, Mo Yan, even before he received the Nobel Prize, he was, uh, by quite some distance, the most translated modern Chinese author ever. More than Lucia, I mean, and he fully deserved the Nobel Prize. I think the reaction from some quarters in, in especially uh, European and European America, I thought was extremely disappointing. Yeah. My best to argue against that. Um, I think Mo Yan, like you know, like most Nobel Prize winners, has gone through a period where he was giving lectures everywhere and, uh, and cashing in, so to speak. Gao uh, Xingjian did the same thing. And he won, yeah. So. Uh, it seems he's writing again. Uh, yeah, I think Mo Yan is, is very intelligent in terms of uh, how he keeps his distance from everybody who tries to push him into a particular slot. Uh, yeah, for political reasons. Right? So if his, I think his acceptance speech at the Nobel Prize is, is a work of brilliance. Yeah, yeah. It gives nobody what they want. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody is disappointed. <laughs> and everybody feels he should have done something else, and, and he just says, "I'm a storyteller. I'm going to tell you some stories. You make them." And he doesn't even spare the translators, right? Yeah, well, that's right. But I yeah, met Moyen once before he won the Nobel Prize. A few months before, he gave a talk at SOAS when I still worked there, and someone in the audience asked him the question, "Why don't you speak out against?" You know, all the injustices and human rights violations, you're such a famous writer, why don't you speak out? And then he got quite annoyed. Actually. He said, you know, Do you think I don't care? Of course I care. But I'm a writer, and when I speak out, I speak out in a literary manner, and not in the manner of politician. And if you read, for instance, his novel, uh, Frogs, yeah. where he basically destroys the one yeah. uh, I mean, that is a hugely, hugely. Yeah, but in a, still in a literary way. So I think he uh, he's, he's not afraid to make these statements, but he insists on making them in a literary way, which I think is something he has in common with Gaussian. Yeah. Both of them actually deserve the Nobel Prize. I think it's very yeah. different kinds. Different kinds. Right? But still, it's very uh, it's very uh, encouraging to know that he's writing again. That's what, as I was in Hong Kong a few months ago, and there was something in the newspaper about that, but I haven't seen the results of it. But I think he'd been to Hong Kong and he'd said in an interview that he was writing. Uh, I would say just an announcement because it's over. But, uh, uh, is there any other question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Moyen is writing. Yeah, good afternoon. I was just curious with regard to how you see 
uh, cultural politics in China vis-a-vis -vis China's exporting of soft power. Mm -hmm. Because it's an strategy of soft power. soft power. Because you see, United Front de Department becoming very, very strong today, absorbing all the state institutions and functions as well. So, how do you, uh, you know, see this as a present day within Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping regime? But during Tang's, you know, he was trying, you know, trying to liberalize in some sort of a way which you alluded in your presentation. But today we see extremely, you know, um, engaging the power in the cage, if what you say, the steel case or something like that. How do you see that? Yes, no, you're absolutely right, and I think. Um, one of the things to look at there, not so much maybe about about literature, but uh, the breakup of this administration for film, radio, yeah. television, and, and I think it was film and television has been moved under the uh, uh, the the, the, Bull, right? yes. the, the Ministry of Communication, <laughs> and for the Department of Communication, so it has been moved under party control, uh, and I okay. think that's that is in some way related, I think, to soft power and to sort of. Uh, controlling the kind of messages that are going out, possibly also internationally, I think. So, um, literature and, and sort of print publishing has, has stayed on the state side, has been yeah. on the exactly. party side. So, I think when it comes to publishing, the party will really, really want to get rid of subsidizing the publishing houses. Yeah. <laughs> they would really just like them to be able to become, you know, market driven. Um, but again, they're reluctant to do that because they're not sure if everybody's going to tell the lie. So, so that's another reason for restricting the space as much as possible and then setting the line and then maybe letting <coughs> go. But, so I think there is a link and I think there are sort of the party is thinking about messaging through culture and controlling that more. But I would say it would probably more be film, television, and sort of visual media rather than written word, which nowadays in you know, movies books. <laughs> so, um, so that's that would be my sort of tentative response. Uh, we have to wait and see what the actual effect of this change will be. It's a very recent change. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions, comments? Okay. Thank you.